so much for coming tonight. Thank you, Rachel, for being here on a whirlwind tour. Um, I think we're going to start out with a reading from Rachel. Ah, yes. Ooh, I happen to have a book right here. Um, thank you for doing this, and thank you to Seattle. My, this is actually my favorite city, and I even tell other cities that. <laughs> Seattle, those are where my people are. I was here a few years ago, and I talked to my dean at American University about whether or not we could have kayaks for our faculty meetings in the Potomac. He was not a fan of that idea. Um, so the book is divided into three sections. The beginning section is called The End, <laughs> um, and it's really a kind of deep narrative dive into one family's story. The middle part is called The Beginning, and that is a deep dive into um, a group of abusers who are trying to be nonviolent. And the last part is called The Middle. <laughs> You can imagine what the editing was like. I'd talk to my editor and be like, let's talk about the beginning. And by the beginning, I mean the middle. And then, yeah. Um, so there's, uh, in the first part, I'm just going to read this first small section about this family in Billings, Montana. In November of 2001, Rocky Moser bought a gun from the Thrifty Nickel, the classified paper where you can buy everything from a ferret to a tractor to a piano. Then he went home where his wife, Michelle, had just fed the kids dinner. A neighbor saw Rocky peering in the windows. Sometime after, one by one, he shot them. Michelle, Christy, Kyle, then himself. It was a case that shocked the entire state. Michelle was young, 23, her kids, six and seven, in first and second grade, learning to read, drawing stick people and lollipop trees, her father, Paul, found Kyle slumped on the stairs, Rocky at the bottom, his face all twisted, scribblings on his arms in what looked like magic marker. Michelle's car was there, and for a few minutes, Paul thought maybe she was alive. He ran to the backyard, then the garage. He saw Rocky's Mustangs, a bag of family videos Rocky had put there. Then the police came, and they found Michelle. Uh, wow. Um, so you, you said in the book that you had previously never thought of domestic violence as an epidemic. And I'm wondering, how did your thinking change? Was there a particular moment or series of moments that changed your thinking on this? You know, I, so I was a foreign correspondent. I think, as you heard, I lived overseas for a long time. I always was interested in stories of um, humanitarian issues, social issues. I did a lot of disaster relief. And, um, you know, domestic violence kind of always sat adjacent to those issues. So I did stories on child brides in Romania and India and, and you know, fistula surgeries in Niger and women in prison for love crimes in Kabul. And domestic violence was part of all of those stories, so much so that as a journalist, and I'm, I'm, definitely can't believe this was ever me, but as a journalist, I never even asked about them. Like, of course, there's domestic violence all over Cambodia, so let's move on to the story. And it wasn't until I was back in, uh, in the U.S. in 2009, and I was um, visiting a friend of mine in Boston, outside of Boston, and his sister pulled up in her car, and she, I said, oh, you know, what do you do? I did that American thing, like, oh, what do you do? Um, and she said, oh, I work in domestic violence homicide prevention. And I, I, like, I thought I misheard her. I was like, how do you prevent domestic homicide prevention? And um, I ended up like, like, sometimes I always want to answer those phones. My students do that. I'm like, give me that phone. Give me that phone. Um, and so I ended up like following her around for the day. She had to go to the farmer's market and she had to go to, like, to, to the liquor store. And I was like, I could really carry a lot of beer. Like, tell me more about this. And that ended up being the germ of, of the book in, in some sense. But I also realized that there was a much, much bigger story to tell. And how long did you spend reporting this book? <laughs> so, so long, so long. My daughter, my poor little daughter, she's 11 years old. She's like, Mommy, I don't want you to tell me any more about domestic violence. I'm like, okay, I'll wait till you're, you know, 12. Um, 
I spent about eight years researching the book. I wrote the book very quickly. I wrote the book in like six months. Um, but I spent years, and I think, I think part of me was putting off writing the book a little bit because it, like, it's hard. It's, it's really, really a hard topic to, to write about. And um, so eight years of research, six months of writing, and like I'm not done. I'm still hearing stories that I've never heard before. I'm still hearing about things I've never heard before, so. When you came into KUOW earlier today, I, I said to you, and I, I think this was like probably a really clumsy way of expressing a thought, I said I was afraid to crack the book at first because of the subject and also because I had read such terrible <laughs> writing about domestic violence in the past. But, you know, having having read the book, it it reads like, fiction it's it gripped me throughout and I wanted to ask you about how you approach writing something you know people don't want to read yeah that is like that is the question I knew from the moment I was reporting this from the moment I was taken with this as a topic that nobody would want to read this I mean we have you know 450 years in this country of not caring about this topic so um I knew I was kind of up against that, not to be like hyperbolic, but like I knew I was sort of up against that. And so in some, and, and also I have an MFA in fiction. Like I've never taken a journalism class in my life. All of my, what? I know, <laughs> I know, right? Oh my God, I was, on a, I was on a panel last week in New York, Penn World Voices, and I was on with Miriam Taves, who just wrote Women Talking, this amazing fiction writer, All My Puny Sorrows, and she's just an incredible writer. And then another woman from Iceland who wrote a, po a extended poem and another one from Japan who wrote a memoir. All three of them had journalism training. I was like, well, this is a little bit of irony, I think. Um, so, but as a, I knew that the only way I could get people to really care about this was to use story. People don't care about, they can't process numbers. Like I could say to you, 50,000 women were killed across the world in 2017. Um, you know, from domestic violence homicide. And you would have a moment where you'd be like, oh, that's terrible. And then you would go on. But if I say to you, um, there's, there's a, a, a woman I know in Massachusetts whose husband used to throw golf balls at her eyes as she was driving down the highway, that clicks, right? Like none of you in this room will ever forget that. So I wanted to use my fiction writing tools. And the challenge as a fiction writer is plot. Right, like how do you know, like Game of Thrones, which I've never watched, admittedly, but like. You don't need to. <laughs> I know, I hear it's a disappointment at the end. But I know that like the thing that, dro that drives something like Game of Thrones is plot. Like what's gonna happen next? And the challenge for, an, for someone in writing nonfiction is you already know what's gonna happen. And so where, where are the places where the, the sort of heartbeat resides? And that, for me, were the places where um, hindsight allows us to look back and see what we've missed. And so that's, that became kind of the driving force. So I, I very consciously wanted the book to read like fiction, because I want, I want people to read it. So you used that example of the man throwing the golf balls at a woman as she was driving. I noticed that you know, throughout the book, there are people whose, whose stories, people whose lives are in danger um, by telling their stories. And also, you know, in order to get access to their stories, you need to protect their identity. Um, so you decided to only use stories in which the details were similar across multiple stories. The thing that was shocking to me as a reader is how specific those details were and how common they were. Like there's this one anecdote in the book about this man who threatened to slit his partner's throat using CDs. Yeah. But that was actually yeah. something that multiple men had. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about yeah. that? Yeah. That, you know what? You're not the only one that was shocked. I too was shocked in that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, streaming services have sort of inadvertently saved lives because no one listens to CDs anymore. But at the time, you know, I've done all kinds of stories. I know it's crazy, right? Um, I've done all kinds of stories on that have ethical conundrums, right? I lived in Cambodia for six years, and when you, when you live in Cambodia, you live among victims and genocide perpetrators, and that is, that is a, like a contradiction in one's neurological hardware to some extent. And I never encountered the kind of ethical dilemmas that I encountered with domestic violence here. In fact, 
when I first was writing about the domestic violence for The New Yorker, I said to my editor, the, the, the woman who had golf balls thrown at her face as she was driving, I spent a year with her. And the New Yorker said, well, you have to interview her ex. And this is a woman who was living in a witness protection program in Massachusetts. She had her mail delivered by private courier. I said, I cannot interview her ex because that would put her in such a dangerous situation. But for the, do we have any journalists in the crowd, by the way? Are there any journalists here? Yeah. So, okay, I see some people who are, like, reticent to... So, the Neiman Foundation just put out a package on best practices for reporting on domestic violence in conjunction with this book for journalists, so I highly recommend um, you go there. But the New Yorker, I said to the New Yorker, like, how do we keep this woman safe? Like, we can't interview him. And my editor, Alan Burdick, was like, I... I don't know. I'm like, oh my God, if the New Yorker doesn't know, I'm screwed, right? Like, it just was um, amazing to me. And I ended up, she ended up being cut entirely from the story. And so my way of kind of going about the ethics was to follow an active case through court and not interview either the victim or the perpetrator um, while they were going through court, which goes against every journalistic, like, standard that you could think of. Um, but the the thing is, when you are reporting on a natural disaster or you're reporting on love crimes in Kabul for you know women in prison or um, Romanian child brides, all of those stories have um, a sense in which the people involved have to figure out how to go on in the aftermath, like they're living in the aftermath. With domestic violence, very often you're in the middle of it and you're gonna be in the middle of it forever. I mean, for as long as you have children or as long as that relationship um, is is a part of your life, and that complicates the reporting so, so much. So a little bit about terms. We're using the term domestic violence uh, because it's familiar. We know what it is. But you express in the book that that term doesn't really cut it. You talk about using the term domestic terrorists or domestic terrorism instead. Tell me more about that. Yeah, I just wrote, um, I just wrote a piece for The Atlantic about this this very thing, I, you know, this is my third book, and I'm, I'm, I'm not precious at all about like somebody. If an editor wants to change something, like you know, they ask you, for example, if you're okay with the font on the inside of a book. I'm like, I don't have any feelings about the font. <laughs> like whatever, whatever the cover design is, like I just don't care. The subtitle of this book is the one and only thing I fought because I didn't want the term domestic violence in there because I didn't think people were read it, frankly. I'm being proven wrong, like, it's amazing. I'm happy to be proven wrong, but um, to me, it's, first of all, an abstract term. Like, it, it replaced battered women syndrome, which is also a problematic term because it leaves anyone who's not heteronormative out of that, that constellation, but, um, but at least it's visual you know, battered woman, you get something in your mind. Domestic violence is, um, it doesn't capture the particular constellation of psychological forces at play. For example, there's a woman in my book whose husband went and got a rattlesnake from an area um, outside of where the city where they lived, Billings, Montana, brought it home and threatened her with it, threatened to put it in bed with her or in the shower with her if she didn't do what he wanted her to do. Like, what do you call that? You don't call that domestic violence. To me, that's tyranny, that's terrorism, that is torture. And so I think what we call something enables how we think about it, and I do think we need a new term. I've spent eight years trying to think of a new term. <laughs> I don't have one yet. Except for intimate partner terrorism, which leaves out certain constellations, but is, I think, a more accurate representation. So in the wake of mass shootings, it seems like there are sometimes moments in which the conversation turns to a previous history of domestic violence. In the book, you say that domestic violence doesn't just predict mass shootings, that more than half the time, those shootings are domestic violence. Why is that distinction important to point out? I'm, I'm glad you asked about that, because this is one of the things that it, it I had I didn't really fully understand it. This comes from research for every town, um, every town 
research who did um, like a long, a deep dive into mass shootings in America. And they don't, they, they're very careful to say that domestic violence does not predict mass shootings, but that in fact more than half the time mass shootings are domestic violence. And you can go all the way back to the first mass shooting in this country with Charles Whitman and the University of Texas Tower shooting. You know, he killed all those students and we forget that he started the night before with his wife and his mother. Or um, John, what's his name, John Allen Muhammad, I think was his name, the sniper in DC, Virginia, Maryland and DC. You know, all the kids for about two months, I didn't live there at the time, but all the kids for about two months had to have indoor recess and there were gas stations that had tarps over their pumps so that you couldn't see when you were, you know, somebody was pumping gas. And, and he was um, engaging in sniper attacks as a way to cover up for the eventual killing of his, his estranged wife, which was his plan. Adam Lanza, in, you know, in Newtown, Connecticut, a, a, a shooting, a mass shooting, that, like I feel like still I'm ne I, like I'll never be cobbled together correctly after that shooting. I just, I can't, I almost can't even talk about it. But you know, he started with his mother, as we all know. And so there are those, there are those type of domestic violence, homicide, mass shootings that are not, um, sort of not positioned as such in the national conversation. But there's another thing where you have something like, um, the Orlando Pulse shooter, Omar Mateen, who um, did not kill anyone in his family when he, when he killed those 49 people at the Pulse nightclub, but he had um, strangled both of his wives, his first wife and his second wife, which is a felony in Florida. In fact, it's a felony in most states, all but about four or five. And he could have, under federal law, been in prison for 10 years. So if we take these things seriously, there is a ripple effect and there's so much um, correlation between domestic violence and all sorts of other social ills that we face in this country. You know, you mentioned the Sandy Hook uh, shooting, and I remember at that time I was working as a fact checker at Mother Jones, and one of my assignments was to uh, write a, uh, obituaries for all, everyone who died in that shooting. Talk about not God being- God bless you. Yeah cobbled together properly yeah. after I finished the assignment, it was fine, and then the next day, I couldn't walk down the street without bursting into tears. And in reporting on rape and sexual violence, I mean, I was actually diagnosed with something called acute stress disorder. And my, you know, people were telling me, you should not report on this. You did something in the book that I haven't seen from a lot of other journalists. You said that you actually needed to take a year off. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I know that Sandy Hook, I was in Costa Rica with my my best, I have these this group of friends, we're all from Chicago, we all live in DC now, we each have one daughter, our daughters are nine, 10, and 11. I don't know how, we didn't do any of that on purpose, but we all traveled together, and we were in Costa Rica together with our daughters, and man, I went to a rooftop yoga class, or like in the top of the jungle or whatever, there's monkeys flying around, and same thing, like I, sobbed uncontrollably through the whole thing. Like I felt like I just couldn't, I just couldn't, yeah. Anyway, um, I did in the fall of 2019. So well, what did you call it? You were diagnosed with what? Acute stress disorder. It's like baby PTSD. If the right. symptoms persist yeah. more than six months, you have PTSD, but under six months, it's just acute right, stress right. disorder. Right, right. So, okay, so I got diagnosed with, maybe it's the East Coast, West Coast thing. I got diagnosed with vicarious trauma, okay. which is like, same thing. Same thing, yeah. So I don't know what the name is. Um, and, it, and it was the same thing. I had, I had actually been in Montana on what's called a fatality review, which is... Um, most states have these teams of people who look at domestic violence homicides and try to figure out where um, you know uh, uh, changes in this in the system would make a difference. And for some reason, I came home from that trip. I'd already been reporting on this issue for four or five years. I'd been you know I went out with the body collectors in Aceh, Indonesia during the the um, Asian tsunami. Like this was not anything that felt palpably different to me. And I came home from that trip and I was like unable to go more than three hours without sobbing, like sobbing. And um, apparently I was like a textbook case. Like I called the therapist who specializes in it and I just like in six minutes over the phone, she's like, oh yeah, you have. So I took, I really took a whole year off. I took all the research 
and um, that I had in my home office and I brought it down to my office at the university. I just couldn't even have it in my house with my, my sweet, adorable little girl. I um, painted, I worked out, I did a, a, like a, a couple of century bike rides. I got really into biking. I just, um, I wrote a memoir uh, that'll you know be out, that'll be my next book, but um, it's something that we don't talk about. And as journalists and you know, aid workers and police officers who deal with traumatized situations, I think that we, A, because we're dealing with people who have lived through these traumas, we have this like automatic thing in our brains that says, well, it's not your trauma, it's theirs. Um, but also we don't talk openly about it and I think we need to. Like I think it's a mental health thing. You know? Yeah, I mean, what you, what you said in the book is that you started to see every man you met as a possible abuser and every woman you met as a possible victim. Yeah, it's yeah. A, it's I I experienced the same thing. You know. Yeah, yeah. I also got divorced. I was like, I mean, I just had a whole like upheaval. Twenty seventeen, I got divorced. My stepmother died. I like moved twice. It was a rough, rough year. Um, but I was coming out of that. I was like finally starting to engage in my life again and, you know, like, feel things again, which was a big deal. Like, the fact that I, you know, like, I'll tell you, I, in, there's an, there's an author's note in the book where, um, so my, so my stepmom, who, who the book is dedicated to her, um, on her, while she was in hospice, I found out that she had been abused in her first marriage, and I went on family medical leave from the university and I was flying out to Arizona where they live, where my parents lived. And um, the morning that she died, I went into the bedroom and I f found her and called my dad in. And he, you know, he just broke down, just sobbing. And within a minute, he was apologizing to me. I'm so sorry I'm not stronger. And it just occurred to me that like, in that moment that like, your your ability to embody your full range of hum human emotion is strength to me. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that was a signal of like real progress for me. And also like, you know, I wrote that in the, in the author's note, which he read and he cried again, but this time he didn't apologize, so. <laughs> progress. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, speaking of progress, one of the things that surprised me in the book is how often dropping or recanting charges is, are actually a sign of escalating violence. Um, and the woman, because it's more often than not a woman, is trying to save her own life. How much do you think this uh, knowledge or perspective has been absorbed by the law enforcement community, so police and prosecutors? Oh, yeah, completely and totally. I mean, I <laughs> That was amazing to me. I felt like, I don't know if anyone's read Malcolm Gladwell, but you know, Malcolm Gladwell's whole thing is like, what is the conventional wisdom? And then let's uh, turn it on its head, right? And I feel like I had the Malcolm Gladwellian experience with this whole book, like every other page. And that's one of the, one of the myths that I, that I sort of try to, excuse me, excavate is that so often when victims recant, it's not because they're not in danger anymore. It's because, in fact, the danger has escalated. And um, they're recanting because there are, there are so many different ways that an abuser has shown her that he's more powerful than the system. He has shown her in his ability to bail out within hours or a day. He has shown her in his ability to skirt any real um, accountability for that violence. Um, there's a woman in the book named Dorothy Gunta Cotter who was in and out of shelters for 20 years. She lived in Massachusetts and um, she, he finally, for the first time ever, had been violent toward one of their daughters who was 11 at the time and she took that daughter and went to shelter in Maine. And he wrote a letter to the school board saying, um, my my wife Dorothy is has mental health issues. She's taken off with our child and kidnapped her um, because he knew that in order to enroll her at another school, she would need those school records. And so he filed that. So he knew how to work the system. And you know, in in less than two months, she was dead. She was killed, and then he killed himself. So victims recanting, according to domestic violence advocates, is in fact a sign that the danger might be increasing, not decreasing.
do you think that uh, police and prosecutors have incorporated that into their <laughs> way of doing things? You're so nice the way you ask questions. You're like, mm, that's the first time it. I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, some of them. I mean, it's not unknown, right? It's called evidence-based prosecution. But if you are in fairness to, to prosecutors, sometimes they have 60 cases in a day. And so they have to just, you know, it's like triage. Um, so I do think that there, that we need to have a better system in trying to determine which cases really are more dangerous and which ones are, are not, uh, you know, which ones are in fact just a very low level of danger, whatever, whatever that means. I, I, you know, I think it's a kind of a meta question. Like, I think that the fact that I'm up here, that I'm like out here in Seattle, that I'm doing this big like 19 city book tour to me is a signal of hope that like we're ready to have a conversation that we just have not had yet in this country. So in a larger way, yes, I hope so. And also like there are that, you know, the NYPD, the New York Police Department just bought 500 copies of the book for, for all their detectives. That's cool. Yeah, I just heard from um, a prosecutor in Poughkeepsie who is buying one for, for the whole county. So I think that there are, um, you know, there are inroads. I mean, I think everyone should read the book. That sounds like I'm, it sounds like I have an ulterior motive in saying that. But like, you know, I really believe that. I mean, I don't have an ulterior motive, and I think you should read the book. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Sydney. So in the book, though, you, you go on police ride-alongs, and you're pretty frank in the book when you think they're screwing up. It was refreshing for me to see that because when I see a journalist do police ride-alongs, I think sometimes they're... Um, maybe sacrificing scrutiny at the altar of access or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that scene in the book where you go to a domestic call and in the absence of police asking this woman the danger assessment questions, you actually do that yourself. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could talk about that and tell me what you learned. Oh, that was such an uncomfortable moment. So yeah, I tried to do ride-alongs wherever I went just to get a sense like of on the ground. And you know, it's so funny. They always put me with like whoever the most liberal cop is. Like who's the one who's gonna like speak the language of the journalist, right? And like they think I don't, I'm not gonna know that or something. And, that, and that's fine, like you know, they're, like they put me with the one cop who reads poetry or whatever. Um, and uh, so I was, I was in Montana and um, I, was, I was with a, a cop. He was lovely, you know, he, he knew all the kind of buzz, buzzwords, but we end up at this domestic dispute, which, oh my gosh, we need to hire new headline writers across the country. But, um, and the aggressor in this case was determined to be the woman and she had a knife and she had locked herself. They lived in, a, uh, she lived in a trailer park, a trailer, sorry, with him and three kids. One was her daughter from a previous marriage and then their two other kids. And it was, I don't know, like one o'clock in the morning. And we show up and she has, uh, he has called the police. She has thrown the knife in a field and we pull up, we're like the third or fourth car there. There's eight or nine cops there. It's Montana, so everybody's white. <laughs> and, um, you know, cops just are intimidating just in what they wear, right? They have big, like, gear everywhere. So they're all just these kind of massive guys. And she's standing there crying, and she's by herself. They're talking to him, but they're not talking to her. And... And most ride-alongs, I'm not supposed to get out of the car. Um, but every once in a while, a cop would say to me, like, oh, I don't mind if you get out of the car, you know? And so I always did when I could, always. And so in this case, he said, I don't, I don't mind if you get out of the car. And I got out. And she must have thought that I was, like, with them, even though I had a notebook or whatever. And no one's asking her anything. And so I say to her, I just start going through this thing called the danger assessment, which is a 20-question um uh, questionnaire to determine risk, essentially. And this is what they use in Massachusetts for their domestic homicide prevention program. And so they include questions like, um, did he beat you? 
while you were pregnant? Has he ever strangled you? Does he have access to a gun? Um, uh, has he, uh, does he have prior history of domestic violence in other relationships? Um, is there, you know, uh, alcohol or drug abuse? And I start going through this and I, and she is telling me things that she's not telling the, the police. So she's been the one, the aggressor here, but in fact, she's retaliating against him. And what ends up happening is that they both get arrested. And, you know, it was such a disappointing moment for me in a way because, um, first of all, there's no way she's gonna get out of that situation and like just return to her home. Like DCFS is gonna come in and potentially, almost surely, gonna take her kids away from her. But also one of the shocking, one of the, there's so many shocking things that I learned while I was researching this, but one of the more shocking ones is that um, researchers will look at domestic, uh, sorry, researchers will look at the homicides of men to determine if their domestic violence resources are adequate in any given state. And when I first heard that, I was like, I felt like a cartoon, like a cartoon, like, what? Like, men, she means women. But no, she meant men. And she said to me, that means that women don't have to kill in retaliation to get out of their abusive situations. There are other resources available to them. This was mind-blowing to me. And I thought of this woman, and I thought, you know, she, according to her, she's retaliating against him for violence, but she's the one being arrested. So one of the questions victims in domestic violence situations get asked a lot is, uh, why, why don't you leave? Why didn't you leave? And I think that, you know, maybe we're beginning to recognize now that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that this is a question that kind of ignores the reality of domestic violence and the steps that women and men take to stay alive. Um, the other two questions you raise in the book are, why aren't people asking, why was he violent? Or why couldn't he stop his violence? I'm wondering after all this reporting you've done, you feel like you have answers to those two questions in the cases you've looked at. Yeah, I mean, let me just unpack that for a minute. I, um, I don't know why we ask that question. Why didn't she just leave? Like, what other crime is the impetus on change on the victim, right? Like, imagine if your house is burgled and you call the police and you say, my God, they took my, you know, my family heirlooms and my whatever. And the police come and say, my God. Why were you living in a house? Yeah. You're, the police come and say, like, that's terrible. We're going to take you away now. But your burglar is going to go ahead and stay in the house, right? Like, that is essentially what we've been telling domestic violence victims for 50 years. You have to come to shelter. You have to be, you know. And when you think about it in that framing, it's, like, so incredibly dumb as a law enforcement <laughs> response, right? And so I had a researcher say to me, uh, no one ever asks why he's violent in the first place or why he stays when he's violent. And I don't, I don't mean to be gender specific. I know that men are victims of violence and, you know, LGBTQ and non-hetero, but it just for the ease of discussion, you have to keep the pronouns straight or it will make everybody crazy. Um, and, you know, I do feel like in my research, one of the one of the takeaways for me was learning that the, the uh, batterers intervention programs I sat in on um, and the men that I listened to don't want to be violent, actually. They just don't know any other way. They don't have another skill set and they're not living in a society that values vulnerability in men. It values machismo and violence as a response to a problem. So in investigating how men might change their behavior, you went to the San Bruno prison and you visited a program that tries to teach men about not just anger management, but specifically about violence toward intimate partners, uh, what motivates it, how to talk about it. During one session, I noticed you, you said that you had to agree to participate in the program um, rather than observe. And that's a weird position for a journalist to be put in. What was that like? Yeah, that was so weird. I mean, you know, it was interesting. So I was in, so the San, San, uh, San Bruno jail has a domestic violence wing. And so all the guys that are in that wing, they're all pre-sentencing. So of course they're all on their best behavior, um, which is fine. You know, I, I know that going in. And um, 
but they their part of their um, program is gender education, and so they're trying to um, uh, get rid of the idea of hierarchies where men are at the top and women are subservient or whatever. And so they said, like anyone who sits in on these sessions is asked to participate in a way to to dissolve that hierarchy. And so as a journalist, I'm like, it, it's sort of like you know, I'm, it's twofold. I'm a journalist, but I'm also a woman, and um, it was weird in a way, but it also, like, I'm very, uh, I mean, part of what makes me a journalist, I think, is my ability to to be comfortable in, like, I'm fine in a black tie setting, or I'm fine in a trailer park, or I'm fine with people in prison. Like, I don't, um, I don't assume anything about anyone. And so, you know, I kind of got over it quickly, my uncomfortable, my uncomfortableness or my, unease. Um, but the other thing was that these guys were in a situation where they were truly allowed to be honest about their fears and about their vulnerabilities in a way that like out in the world there are just so many forces I think against that. And so it was incredibly touching a lot of times. Also they finish every day by doing yoga. It's so California. Like it was so West Coast. They're like we would like to invite you to do yoga with us. I was like of course you would. <laughs> Of course, I will say yes. Who would say no to that? Like, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. There's something very good about a final Shavasana. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so one of the people in these programs he spent a lot of time with was a man named Jimmy. And uh, he was one of the people who led this program. And then something really weird happened with Jimmy. Tell us what happened to your reporting relationship with Jimmy and the question that you asked him before it all changed. Um. What was the question? I, okay, well, I'll answer that other. I can't remember. I, you know, I can't remember what the question I asked him was. Um, it was about his. Uh, what happens with his? What happened with? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Jimmy Espinoza is. Uh, it was a great character. He um, was in prison for domestic violence in this very uh, in this very jail, and he went through this program himself. And then um, he got out of jail and became a facilitator. One of the things about this program is that it's peer-led. Um, so they really want, like, violent men who have made a commitment to be nonviolent to be the leaders. It wasn't, just, it wasn't created by um, violent men, but they're the ones who are its facilitators. So he's working in the prison now where he was once uh, an inmate. And which is interesting because the guards, you know, are really, really friendly to him. And he was also, he lives in San Francisco. He was a drug addict. He was a pimp. He's incredibly intimidating just visually. He's, he's bald. He's got tattoos of all the famous um, tourist sites of San Francisco on his head. He's missing like half his teeth. He was, I was, uh, I was watching him in class one day and my daughter FaceTimed me and I was like, oh, sweetie, say hi to Jimmy. And she was like, <laughs> yeah. um, so, but he, you know, he, um, he was really a character and I spent a lot of time, I mean, I don't know, three years or something flying back and forth. I watched him in San Bruno in the jail. I watched him, um, in, his, in, uh, the sheriff's office where he also held classes. Um, he took me on uh, all around his old, you know, district Excelsior where he grew up and then the mission where he had his girls. Um, and then I said to him, like, I've got to interview your ex and your daughter because he would tell these stories of kidnapping his ex and he would tell these stories of his daughter um, who's now 19 or 20 uh, being raped by um, a family acquaintance and he would never connect me to them. And, you know, as a journalist, I have ways of finding people, but I didn't want to, you know, it takes a long time to build up trust with someone, and I really would rather just be upfront about what I need to do and who I need to talk to. But I couldn't not talk to him. I sent him email after email. I called him. I talked to his boss. It was about two years where I was trying to get hold of his ex, and he never would let me get hold of her. And I finally did just go uh, go around him, and I I found her, and I got a hold of her, and she agreed to go on the record. And her story was very different from his. In fact, the story he tells about like their 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 final um, 
violent moment, the one that landed him in, in jail, it, is actually in certain ways more violent than the story she told. Um, and But she doesn't trust him. She still doesn't trust him. And I, I feel like that's a, you know, I'm not trying to paint a world in which people, um, I don't know, are redeemed, right? Like that's Hollywood. I think the real world is more complicated and I think Jimmy is doing the best he can and like he, he screws up and um, he still has a little bit, you know, he's still trying to maintain a little bit of control but weirdly enough, he texted me right before I came here tonight. So he, he yeah, so in the book, it, you, he drops out of contact. He drops out. I don't hear from him for years until literally here I am in Seattle. And he's like, hey, how's it going? I'm like, uh. And the question was, um, when you're trying to get in touch with his ex, and he says he doesn't want to do that, he, he doesn't want to re-traumatize them, you're like, yeah. why do you think it's appropriate for you to dictate what a grown woman yeah. does or does not do? And yeah. that's when... Yeah, yeah, and then he just, he, he ghosts me. Um, and I think, you know, uh, I would like to believe that that redemption is, is cleaner than that, but I think it's difficult. I mean, I think his, you know, his ex Kelly said to me, like, I know that he uses my story in his groups, and I've come to terms with that. It's partly why she was willing to talk to me, because she said everyone knows our story anyway. Um, but she said, I just don't want to be part of it. And that to me feels like a very real scenario, like that she's like, yeah, he abused me and I've moved on with my life, but it doesn't mean I'm going to, you know, welcome him. So what did Jimmy say when he texted you? <laughs> he said, he said, oh, send me a um, picture of the cover and I'll put it on my Facebook page and I'm sure a lot of people will buy it. And I was like, a lot of people are buying it, Jimmy. <laughs> I didn't say that. I just, you know, I, I, um, I'm not so easily manipulated, right? So, I, I mean, I, I, I think that what he's doing is, is good, and I support what he's doing, and he's trying, he's really trying to make a difference in a lot of men's lives. Like, do I trust him as a person? Nah, probably not so much, you know? And he wasn't the only source who backed out of the process. You also spoke extensively to a man, and I can't imagine how difficult this was, who had killed his wife and daughter. Um, oh yeah, that was really hard. Yeah. Why? Why do you think he agreed to talk to you in the first place, and then why do you think he backed out? Yeah, he. That was supposed to be an assignment for the New York Times Magazine, and um, I spent a whole summer, like fourteen hours, with that guy. In the book, I call him uh, Patrick pa Patrick O'Hanlon. Yeah, um, which is a pseudonym. And I think, I mean, my sense of him was that. He, he wanted some absolution for this terrible thing he had done and that he realized he wasn't going to get it, right? Um, and, and so he backed out and we had, to, we had to end up, we ended up killing the story for the magazine because if someone isn't going to participate in fact checking, then it's, you know, it's, you're not going to get published in the New York Times. Um, but I, I kept it in the book and I give a rationale for it. And, that was that was emotionally really difficult. Like I even had these thoughts of like, am I gonna shake his hand? Like he didn't, he used a barbell to kill them. And I just, it, it was like this utter, utter disgust in me. But I also feel like we don't learn anything if we don't talk to these people. Like we can't hope to try to figure out why they're doing the things they're doing. And this particular crime, familicide it's called, um, is drastically on the rise in the U.S. I'm sure you all know the story of Chris Watts in Colorado, right? Who killed his his wife and two daughters. Um, those are the public ones, right? They tend to be white, middle class, or middle upper class. They tend to have financial issues. They're kind of a separate category from domestic violence homicides. And I just felt like to not include those um, is to miss a big important part of the story, but it definitely was difficult to talk to that guy. Why do you think that familicides tend to be white, upper middle class men? You know, there's only one researcher in the U.S. who is um, looking at that. So there's not nearly enough research. 
the one thing about familicides is there seems to be a lot of shame and a lot of the, the relationships tend to be very gendered. So like in the home, the woman is the caretaker and the housekeeper and, you know, takes care of the family's emotional needs. The man is the one who is supposed to support them. You often find um, a lot, like a lot of religion in these kind of relationships, a, a ton of secrecy. So like there are so many examples of men who have lost their jobs and then kept it from their wives, like kept going as if they were going to the office every day, putting on a suit or whatever. And before I interviewed him, I corresponded with a number of them. They, they In about 80% of cases, they kill themselves. Um, so there's about 20% of the cases, Chris Watts being one of them, where they don't kill themselves. And I wrote to a whole bunch of them who are imprisoned across the country today. And a number of them wrote back to me. I, I mean, prisoners have a lot of time on their hands. They almost always write back. It's weird. But, um, uh, it, you know, I... I don't think that the research has come up with any conclusive sort of aha, this is why. But the first cases of familicide in this country, which go all the way back to the 17th century, there's writings about them and the and the the parallels are the same. Like this deep shame about their economic situation, these very gendered views, this very sort of black and white thinking, very often religious, it's eerie. So, um we're getting to the time where it's going to be your questions, but I still I still want to ask a few, and then we're going to do a reading. Um, but I promise to speed through these. Um, oh, okay. Um, so one question in your reporting surfaces again and again, and it's: Can a violent man learn to be nonviolent? What do you think? I hope so. Um, no, I mean I think I think someone who's violent can learn to be nonviolent, but they have to want to. They have to see the benefit in it for them. Um, but I also think like, what is our alternative to do nothing to just lose these, you know, the, the, the one thing I should mention here is that um, for decades, for two decades, we've used this stat of three women a day killed in the US. Since 2017, for the first time in 20 years, that stat is now four. That's an increase of 33%. Someone checked my math when I was on Fresh Air, and they were like, that's not a 25% increase. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry, I have like fourth grade math. Um, and I think, what is our alternative? To not do anything and just allow children and women to die, and some men, but mostly children and women? Yeah, of course I have to believe that they can change. It also seems like one of the tensions inherent in this issue is that you know, the frustration that many advocates have is the criminal justice system's failure to hold abusers accountable, give them appropriate or lengthy sentences. But the book also wrestles with the question of what does that do? Like, does that help? Do you think law and order can fix this? Yeah, I mean, we, honestly, we cannot arrest our way out of this situation. We really can't. And, um, you can't have a discussion of domestic violence without having a corollary discussion of the the problem with you know sentencing in this country and and um, prison reform. But I do think that we need to be open to other alternatives. There's a there's a um, uh, um, program that I want to write about in another country. I'm not going to say which, so you know I can write about it, but it seems really interesting where um, men who are convicted of domestic violence misdemeanors are not sent to jail, but in fact are sent to a kind of halfway house where they go to work during the day, um, and then at night they come home and they have gender education, or they, they go to this home, not their home. They have gender education, they have, um, they learn uh, childcare, housekeeping skills, emotional, um, intelligence and they kind of excavate their their own violent tendencies. To me, that sounds really interesting and progressive. I think I think you know I'd like to find out more about that. Do you want to keep reporting on domestic violence? I kind of do. I kind it's weird. Like as a reporter, what draws you in? But like you know, I've been on the road for like just a couple of weeks, and I'm hearing so many new things. I. I feel like I'm not, or the topic is not quite done with me yet. I don't know. 
Okay, thank you for answering my questions. We'll now turn to yours. I think Shane's gonna take it from here. I wanna, can I just say one thing while you're doing whatever you're doing with that mic? Um, so the first third of the book is a story about this woman, Michelle Monson Mosier, who was killed by her husband, Rocky, and then he killed their two kids, and then he killed himself in Billings, Montana. And when you do a story like this, not only does it take enormous trust and enormous time for the families to talk to you, and I spent a lot of time with her family and with his family, but it takes um, real courage to be able to ask someone these difficult questions and for them to answer. Like, so many tears are shed, so many. And I just want to say to all of you that her mother is here tonight, and um, I am... I don't even have words for how grateful I am for the sheer number of hours that she spent answering questions and emails and like the tiniest little thing to make sure I got the facts right. And um, I will be forever grateful and you know that Michelle is saving a lot of lives, Sally. Wow, I have a lump in my throat. My heart goes out to you. Your personal courage is astounding to me. Um, so for the two of you, thank you so much for the work that you do. Um, I want to recommend a book to you. Uh, it's a book called Trauma Stewardship. And I'm currently a student at the University of Washington earning a doctorate in nursing practice. And um, we, in our practice group, we're coming up with a program to study and work on in terms of changing our practice. And we were going down a path of cardiac health for women and someone heard your interview with Terry Gross on NPR wow. and she's like we have to do this and so we're working on a project to look at that screening tool and how do you implement that into practice so that every provider who takes care of a woman does that screening tool universally. So um, the question I wanted to ask was in Seattle one of the things that we'll focus on is educating providers number one about the screening tool but also about resources. So in Seattle, there's this fantastic program at Harborview, the Sexual Assault Center, and um, they have a fantastic track, rec track record. So in, in dealing with um, supporting women uh, and helping them to not become statistics and fatalities, um, how many communities that you have, either one of you have uh, encountered, have this kind of deep commitment in the community to supporting uh, women or anyone who has been traumatized either by sexual violence or trauma in the home and you know, really surround them with resources and help them move through um, the trauma and recovery? You know, um, the group that, so when I was interviewed on Fresh Air, I was, it was with Suzanne DeBuse who started this high-risk team movement, and um, they've been active, they've been uh, taking cases since 2003, and not only have they not had a, a domestic violence homicide since then, um, they've only had 9% of their clients have to go into shelter. And that is such a huge thing, because you're keeping someone in their community then, you're keeping someone um, around the people who uh, can give them, offer them support in all kinds of ways. And, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all situation. I mean, they use a lot of GPS, for example. GPS would work in a place like Seattle. It doesn't work as well in a place like Colorado or Montana that's very rural where the distances are greater and there might be mountains that kind of, you know, screw up the satellite. Image. So I think that every community needs to look at what their options are out there and, and adapt them. Um, but I do think that dangerassessment.org is an invaluable website and tool for anybody um, who is interested in this line of work. Along with, you said you're nursing, you're in nursing. I mean, I think that um, traumatic brain injury and domestic violence victims is is severely under-resourced and underutilized. So I would, you know, try and do trainings for healthcare workers on strangulation and traumatic brain injury. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your work. You know Seattle, my favorite city. <laughs> I still have yet to see Eddie Vedder here, though. Um, my question is, what about before it hits the physical abuse, murder, near murder, mm -hmm. and why is 
that level of abuse mostly sanctioned until that point. All the reports leading in advance, I think, and I'm totally not in this field, but I think they are mostly sanctioned and that's why it gets to this point. Never, I like your point about the earlier behavioral interventions and preschool and good education and coping skills and manage your emotions, but, but that part of our society sanctions this behavior about control and manipulation and power and roles and does you know, that? it's true. I have yet to meet a victim, and I've met a lot, you've met a lot as well, whoever, like, who doesn't say some version of, like, I'm not your typical victim. I mean, no one ever recognizes themselves. And, um, you know, I think, so there's a great book by Dr. Evan Stark called Coercive Control, which is essentially what you're talking about. And, you know, we there's coercive control laws um, in the UK, in France, I think Germany might have one now. Um, and there are coercive control bills being talked about in California and New York. Of course, California and New York, right? <laughs> like, no surprise there. Um, and I think that those are potentially promising, but I also think it's just, it, like, we need to be able to um, have resources so that, that victims can recognize that they're in that kind of situation so that when someone says to them, you know, their partner says to them, I know your family doesn't like me. I don't really want to go over there for Thanksgiving this year. I know your friend doesn't like me. And there's this kind of slow corrosion of selfhood. To me, that is, um, that's the kind of education. You can't litigate that. Right? I mean, all you can do is educate people. I, re I went around with this um, detective in Cleveland who's just this amazing character. And I should say that the last third of the book is like solutions. It's not all like this terrible, terrible. I try to offer some solutions. But, you know, she goes to a lot of homes. She's a high risk domestic violence detective. So she's only dealing with high risk situations. But again and again, I heard some version of the sentence that was like, well, you know, my dad was the same way, he can't help it, or, you know, oh, it's normal for me. And she was always like, this is not normal. This is not normal. And I think that is a message that needs to get out to, to young people, to the community, to women in these situations, like, or, or men, right? It can just as easily be men. That is not normal, to be isolated from one's family, from one's friends, from one's support system. That's the start of it. Huh? Gaslighting. Gaslighting, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I had, I had a, a woman in, um, I, I think it was in Chicago, and she asked me if, um, if, dom if domestic violence was a metaphor for the Trump administration. <laughs> I was like, maybe. I'm not gonna say. <laughs> I mean, w one of the things that I think about is domestic violence is it's such a huge, sprawling issue. It, it's so multifaceted. It intersects with so many other issues, homelessness, the criminal justice system. Um, I'm wondering, and there, you probably don't have a clear-cut answer, what the biggest gaps in the system are. W where, do you, where do you think the biggest gaps are? Where can we start? Like, where can we I know, in? I'm like, um... Oh, uh, well, I mean, I think, I think there's, I would say, I, I guess I would say there are three gaps. Law enforcement, health, and um, what I would call like a victim's community. So I think that law enforcement needs better training on the, on the nuances of domestic violence. You know, I, um, Michelle's mother will tell you that when they called, that when they finally called the police on Rocky, the police showed up at her house and they said to her, what, what do you want us to do? What, what should we charge him with? Like, as if she's the that's expert so, on it, right? That's so messed like, up. That's yeah. Um, I mean, the, in, in fairness to, to Billings, Montana today, they do ha actually have a domestic violence, um, dedicated domestic violence police officer, so that would be unlikely to be a question today, hopefully. Um, I also think that health care needs to, and I think they're getting better at this, ask questions um, about domestic violence, about um, injuries, and about potential traumatic brain injury. But the other, the other thing that the research shows is that a lot of victims don't ever interact with law enforcement or um, the healthcare system, that in fact they talk to clergy or coworkers. 
Right, and so I think that there needs to be awareness in those circles as well. Any other questions from folks? Lower my mic. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to say thank you for both of you for taking your time uh, for being here. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, my first question is, is your book free for all of us? <laughs> is it free? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> is it? <laughs> is the book free? I don't think it is. I don't think I don't so. Oh, it's for sale. Oh, for sale. Oh, Okay, anyways. That's above my pay grade. <laughs> uh, oh, I gotta give it a shot. Okay, um, I have a list of questions here and hopefully you can maybe try your best to answer it. Um, my first I have a 4 a.m. flight to catch. So. Yeah, okay. okay. How did you, <laughs> um, how did, based on the, I know that you've done eight years of researching and you've done like six months of writing the book. I was wondering how did you get these women and men to tell their stories and put it in your book? Because it's very hard, it's already hard enough to talk about it. So I was wondering how did you reach out to these individuals? That's a good question. Yeah, I know. I know. Everyone asks me that. I I mean, partly it's time. With, the, with a book, you have the luxury of time that you don't have with a radio station or newspaper or magazine. So um, I, you know, I operate on my own timeline. So that's one thing. Um, I, I think another thing is, is that I come, I come through people that they already trust. I try to come through people. So in the case of Jimmy um, Espinoza in, San, in San, the San Bruno jail, um, I met him through his boss. And so I think the first time we met, he felt obligated to meet with me. But then, you know, I'm, I'm very human. I don't, um, I mean, I think I'm easy to talk to and um, I don't try to be judgmental. So people are generally willing to meet with me again. Um, in the case of Sally, I think that I came to you through the fatality review team um, in Montana and I, I came to the fatality review team through researchers. I mean, there's always a, there's always a chain. And the other thing, I, I, I don't know if you found this, Sydney, in your research, but I have found that um, one journalistic story always leads to the next one. I mean, it's just amazing how that happens to me. But um, so I think just time. There are people who say no. They're just not in the book, you know. <laughs> Sally, I'm actually wondering what it was like for you to be on the other end of this process. I mean, there are two journalists up here talking about how we feel. I'm wondering what it was like for you. If you I don't know if you'd be willing to answer. Yeah, give her the microphone. Not to put you on the spot, Sally. Well, one of the things that, um, you know, after my daughter and grandchildren were murdered was it was horrific to me to see the lack of uh, police and criminal justice system and the way that they responded. And it seemed like she didn't stand a chance in hell to ever have survived. And so that was what really prompted me to start, like, people need to know this People just need to know her story. People need to know that this is how things like this are being handled and why so many women are dying and children. And so I just kind of started doing my own reaching out. And um, my daughter's case was the first fatality review in Montana. And I think that's how Rachel um, and I got connected. But I was, I and I still am so very grateful for someone like Rachel to tackle this kind of subject. and. You know, for me, my daughter's story hopefully will make a big difference. And that means so much, you know. And to have people like Rachel and people that really do care and do want, you know, this change that needs to happen. So. One more question, if that's okay. It's a very, it's a big, important question. Um, what the last one is, um, how can students raise awareness on, pr sorry, I'm joking. <laughs> it's a hard topic to talk about, sorry. Yeah. Oh, stick it together, okay. Um, how can students raise awareness on preventing domestic violence? Um, especially for those who've experienced, and who experienced domestic violence, how can we raise our voice and how can we escape from what we've experienced? So um, I teach on a college campus and um, you know, Title IX is the big thing on college campuses. I think 
one of the things, and I don't, I don't know if this is a disappointing answer or not, but I feel like voicing our stories um, is the first step. I think we need to be able to tell people. We need to be able, if, if, if gaslighting is happening, or if we have a, a girlfriend or you know, a guy friend and they're being isolated by their kind of new partners, um, to me, those are, those are signs that something could be amiss, not always, but it's just the, like an awareness that has the beginning of a conversation in a safe space for those, um, for those conversations to happen. So I think the first thing I would say is to tell, to tell your story, right, to somebody. Um, and to not be afraid to probe a little bit into your friends' lives or what might seem private. You know, as journalists, what, you know, I teach um, interviewing to, to my graduate students, and one of the things I say to them is, if you are concerned about a friend, um, one of the interviewing tactics that I use is just to repeat their words back to them. So, you know, if I was to say to, to Sydney, like, oh, you've covered, um, you know, sexual assault on campuses before, tell me more about sexual assault on campuses, or some, some way of, like, sort of using their language back because it automatically forces them to go deeper into that answer. Um, the other thing I would say is that Danger Assessment website, dangerassessment.com or dangerassessment.org, it does have these 20 questions for risk factors and risk assessment. I did a risk assessment on Sally's daughter, Michelle, a post-mortem risk assessment, and there's there's a couple of questions that we don't have an answer to, but she, she scored like an 18 out of 20, like really high. Um, and I feel like had someone done that with her along with the timeline, she would have had a better sense of her situation, I feel like. Um, but on that same website, there are a couple of apps specifically for college students that you can program this app to call either 911 or call a close friend who will call 911 on your behalf if you're in um, a sticky situation. And your phone will, that app will automatically go to like Spotify or some other some other app so that if someone takes your phone, they don't see that you've just called 911. And I can't remember the name of them right now, but they're on the danger assessment website. So there's some resources that I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, that's all the time that we have this evening. We do have third place books in the back there selling the book. And Rachel will be back in a few minutes to do some book signing as well. So thank you again so much for attending this evening. Thank you. Thank you.